Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Marianne, for the prayer. Um, If you don't know me, my name is June, and I serve as one of the pastors. And it is great delight and honor to be bringing God's word to you this morning. I really pray that God will speak to you through the word, um, the word that you need to hear from him today, whether it's a word of encouragement or comfort, empowerment uh, or challenge. This summer, we are going through the book of Psalms, and today we come to Psalm 45. Psalm 45. And before we read it together, uh, let me tell you a few things about the psalm that I believe will help us understanding it better. And I think the good way to do that would be to take a look at the superscription that's been given to this psalm, the titles. Uh, short titles that's been uh, traditionally attributed to the psalm. So uh, it says, Psalm 45, for the director of music to the tune of lilies of the sons of Korah, a masculine a wedding song. It's a rather long title, unusually long title, uh, describing what this psalm is. Uh, kind of like how our hymn books introduced to us individual songs with the title, with the names of uh, those who composed it, and sometimes even how it should be sung, how fast or how powerful. Uh, So you can think of these titles, which are probably not original to the psalm, but were later uh, given to the psalm. So when it says, for the director of music, it shows us that this psalm was intended for a public worship service. And to the tune of lilies refers, of course, to the, uh, the musical tune that this would be sung in, which we uh, no longer know. Uh, but it could also mean what kind of instruments should be used in singing this song. The phrase, of the sons of Korah, identifies the writers of the song. Sons of Korah, by this time, refers to the temple musicians, the the worship uh, musicians of the temple. And in the whole book of Psalms, we have 11 songs that are attributed to them. A masculine is the title given to the songs in the psalm that particularly teaches or imparts wisdom. So whenever we see this title, we know that this particular psalm contains the word of wisdom from God. And then, of course, a wedding song that's very straightforward, uh, a song specifically written or even commissioned uh, for a wedding. And now, as we will see, Psalm 45 is not just any wedding song, but it's a royal wedding song written for the occasion of the wedding of the king. So now let's read the rest of the psalm, and I've asked Angie to lead us in reading of the God's word. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace, since God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. 
You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From palaces adorned with ivory, the music of the strings makes you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The city of Tyre will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments, she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her, those brought to be with her. Led in with joy and gladness, they enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Angie, and thanks be to God for his word. I think you will agree that in, in any culture on earth, uh, Wedding is probably one of the most celebrated occasions in life, whether it's uh, in North America, South America, Asia, Middle East, Africa, Europe. Uh, wedding is one of the most celebrated occasions in our lives. And I think that's because we can all agree that love is one of the most important things in life. And wedding probably is the tangible expression of such love. And I think that's why we celebrate it like none other. And we are willing to spend a lot of money to make that occasion as special as possible. And more than that, now we are talking about a royal wedding, right? Um, I, I personally don't have any experience of watching or being part of a royal wedding other than watching short clips of the British royal wedding on TV. Uh, but maybe some of you come from a culture where you're more familiar with royal weddings. I have a friend from Thailand who have experienced uh, the royal wedding. Uh, perhaps some of uh, the Dutch uh, folks here may remember a, a Dutch royal wedding uh, that happened in your life. Perhaps one of the most extravagant uh, weddings that we can see. Uh, I remember, was it like two years ago when, uh, when the, the British royal wedding happened, how people all around the world were talking about that royal wedding and talking about every detail of, of the wedding, whether it was the dress of the bride or even the dress of the guests. I, I remember Lynn talking about the stroller that one of the <laughs> guests brought in. Uh, it's, it's talked about around the world. Uh, it's a big celebration, uh, uh, definitely for the whole nation and beyond. And in most weddings, as you will agree, the big focus is on the bride, right? The big focus is on the bride, and the bride is the main figure of the whole event. And I can say that because I remember my wedding now 12 years ago. Um, and I remember how unimportant I was at the wedding. <laughs> I almost felt they could have done it without me. <laughs> um, I remember my wife, Lynn, having this little room, uh, what do you call it, a chamber, a waiting room for the bride, all decorated with uh, fancy chairs and everything, and how everyone was coming there to talk to her, to take photos with her while I was in the lobby by the door. <laughs> um, and that morning, I remember how she, it took the bride several hours to be ready when I was ready in about 15 minutes. And of course, at the wedding, everyone was speaking about how, how beautiful the bride was. And they were talking to me about how beautiful the bride was. And 
not much about the groom. <laughs> well, no hard feelings. That's how the weddings are, right? But as you have read in the psalm uh, we looked at this morning, that's not the case for this wedding. At this royal wedding of Psalm 45, it's all about the bridegroom. It's all about the king. As we have read, this psalm is filled with praises about the groom. He is handsome, he is beautiful, and he is wise, he is majestic, he is powerful. All the nations and even the enemies bow before his feet. Not only that, he is gracious, he is just, he is humble, he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. So in a way, he is beautiful outside and beautiful inside. He is perfect. And then when the psalm now speaks about the bride, interestingly, um, it doesn't have the same kind of praise for her. Yes, the psalmist speaks about her beauty, but it's more of her beauty in the eyes of the king. And yes, the psalmist, psalmist speaks about the beautiful garment that she is wearing, but those are from the king. Those are of the king. So compared to the praises of the king, uh, there is very little uh, to say about the bride. And the word of advice the psalmist gives to the bride is this. He is your king. He is your Lord. Honor him and bow to him. So indeed, this is a very different kind of wedding than what we would envision. So, yes, it's a beautiful psalm, it's a beautiful wedding song, but probably not the one we would use at one of our weddings, unless we have a very narcissistic groom. So then the question for us is, what does this wedding song, this ancient royal wedding song, has to do anything with us today? We don't actually, uh, we don't even actually know who this king is. Uh, we don't have anything that connects us to a particular king uh, in the Bible. Uh, we speculate it's one of the sons of David, uh, one of the descendants of David, but there is no clear proof. Uh, historically, people have, commentators have uh, thought, perhaps this is the wedding of the Solomon, uh, but we don't know for sure. So what makes this psalm relevant for us today? Well, if you are familiar with how some of the psalms and other passages in the Old Testament, how they um, not only speak about what's immediate to them or the immediate event or immediate happening, uh, but also they point to a future time or someone in the, who will come in the future. And it's not uncommon in the Old Testament that we see and find some of those psalms or passages or uh, the messages from the prophets. That's why we call them prophetic psalms or prophetic messages or even prophetic events in the Old Testament, pointing us toward to something that is to come. If you are familiar with the tone and the language of such prophetic uh, messages in the Old Testament, in Psalm 45, uh, you will certainly sense that there is more to this psalm than just the wedding of a king. Because a lot of the languages used to describe this king and to praise this king are the very same language that the Old Testament uses to describe and praise God and also the coming Messiah. So in that regard, uh, probably out of the whole psalm, the most puzzling yet most important verses are I think verses 6 and 7, where it says, 
your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. So this is difficult to understand because after the psalmist was praising the king uh, for his beauty, for his righteousness, for his power, all of a sudden he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. He is referring to the king as God. And then he says in the next verse, uh, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy your god has anointed with you with the oil of joy so so do you see what's happening here the psalmist begins by uh praising the king saying you are worthy you are beautiful you are righteous you are powerful then all of a sudden he calls the king god and then again says god has anointed you so this has puzzled uh, readers of the, the passage for such a long time. And that's why even the Jewish commentators of the time have considered this psalm to be prophetic. They have concluded that this can't just be about a king and a wedding, but it's prophetic and even messianic because it was too apparent that this was more than uh, just about a king or a wedding. And I think if uh, we think of verse 1 again, where the psalmist was saying how, how inspired he was in his heart when he was writing these words, perhaps that's a little clue for us how God, has, God, God has captivated and inspired this, this writer of the psalm to perhaps even without him realizing uh, in, his, in his writings uh, were giving us prophetic words of the, the true king that will come one day. And for us, thankfully, praise to God, we learn that indeed that is the case because we have another passage in the New Testament that that almost shed light on this passage for us to understand. And that is, that's in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is how it reads. But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So you can see that this is a direct and exact quote from Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. So the, writer, so the writer of the Hebrews is telling us that in a prophetic way, in a way that we will not be able to fully comprehend, this ancient royal wedding song was also a proclamation of the Son, the Son of God, the true King of all kings, Jesus Christ. So listen to what one commentator says about this passage, and many others agree. The words of these two verses, and he is referring to the Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. The words of these two verses together are incomprehensible unless they are understood to refer to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Only he can be called God and at the same time the Father as his God. So now with that understanding, with that light on Psalm 45, we can make a better sense of this psalm that may have sounded too good to be true, even for a king. Now we are ready to see this psalm as an expression of praise to the beauty of the Son beauty of Christ, the true king of all kings, the one to whom belongs all splendor and majesty that the psalm speaks about. He is the most gracious, most humble, the most righteous, 
and the most victorious king of all, to whom all the nations and even the enemies bow down. But still, I think the question remains, if this king indeed is Jesus, if this king that the Psalm 45 refers to is King Jesus, the Son of God, how does that become good news for us? And here is what I mean by that. Okay, he is beautiful, he is perfect, he is so powerful, but what does that have to do with me if he is not my bridegroom, right? What does it have to do with me if a bride, bridegroom is so handsome, so powerful, so perfect, if he is not my bridegroom? This perfect king, beautiful inside and out, full of grace, full of truth, full of humility and justice. Who in the world is this king going to marry? And who is worthy enough? Who, who can match? What, what bride and, and uh, whose beauty can match the beauty of this king? What kind of bride is worthy of this, this picture-perfect royal wedding, this, this extravagant, lavish royal wedding? And the surprising answer to that question is that it is you and I, the church. We are the bride of Christ. This is an amazing story. King Jesus came into the world to take a wife. And that's us. He came to marry us. We often say, God, Jesus came to the earth to save us. Jesus came here because he loves us. But it, it almost sounds too good to be true when we say, Jesus, the true king, the perfect bridegroom, came to the earth to marry us, to take us as his bride. When, the John, uh, when uh, John the Baptist was still alive and he, when he was baptizing uh, people, Jesus also began to baptize people and, and his followers. So one day, some of the followers of John came to him quite upset. And they said to John, uh, that guy that was with you on the other side of Jordan, now he is baptizing people and everyone's going to him. Everyone's following him. And this is what John said at the time to them. He said, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. So what is he saying? He is saying, I am not the bridegroom. There is no point for people now to come to me. They should be coming to the bridegroom, who is Jesus. And the brides belong to him. We are his bride. But never be mistaken, uh, it is not because we are worthy to be uh, such bride or we are so beautiful, but because the king, our bridegroom, chose to love us and he has covenanted with us and promised us to make us beautiful. Certainly we are not worthy of this royal wedding, but the king has chosen us and he has clothed us with his beauty with his glory and with his righteousness so we are not the focus of the wedding he is but then he has made us to be the focus of the wedding the beautiful bride i hope you will remember uh, ephesians uh, this verse from ephesians 5 which we uh, recently uh, was going through 
in our sermon series. In chapter 5, where Paul speaks about the relationship between husband and wife, and this is what he said. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So brothers and sisters, this is the glorious reality and identity of who we are in Christ. And the glorious identity, glorious uh, uh, point that Psalm 45 has been pointing toward. This is who we are. This is who we have become in the bridegroom. The bride of the king. Radiant, holy, and blameless before the one who loves us and is enthralled by our beauty. Can you believe that? The, the, the bridegroom is enthralled by our beauty that he has given to us. This is probably an image a little bit harder to swallow for guys here, but this is the image that the Christ imparts to us, that we are all his bride and we are so beautiful in his eye. And the good news is we don't need to pretend to be beautiful. We don't need to pretend to be blameless because our groom, Jesus Christ, he has already saw everything and he already knows everything. He knows how ugly we are. He knows how filthy we are. He knows how unfaithful we are. Yet, he did not live us. He had all the chance to live us if he wanted. But this king, this beautiful king, this gracious king chose to remain faithful to his ugly and broken wife. Because on the cross, he took all our sin, our shame, and our brokenness to himself. So remember this. We cannot surprise him. Even the worst of who we are will not surprise the, bri uh, the bridegroom. Nothing can make him love us less or more because he fully loves us. And it is such love of the bridegroom, this sacrificial love, this redemptive love that will change us into the glorious bride that we were called to be ready for the great wedding. And toward the end of the Bible, uh, the book of Revelation once again describes this royal wedding like this. In Revelation chapter 19, it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. And let's read this together. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. So yes, Psalm 45 is a story of a king and his new bride. But this is not just any king. This king is the savior of the world. And he has made the bride beautiful. And this marriage will never end. Nothing will be able to separate the bride from the groom. Nothing. This king is Jesus Christ, and the bride is his church. This king is perfect. He is beautiful. He is gracious. He is just. And he shall reign forever and ever. And to him, our praise will never end. And all God's brides, together we say, Amen.